Nellie Hicks was a 59-year-old mother of six children. She was a fourth grade teacher at Ashland School in San Lorenzo, California. On May 10, 1972, Nellie was at her home in Newark, California. She lived with her adult son and his wife, as well as her longtime friend. Nellie's friend, also a teacher, briefly spoke with her around 1 a.m. that fateful morning. She was dozing off on a living room sofa. It was the last time she was seen alive. About four hours later, Nellie's son discovered her lifeless body in the same room. Her wallet was missing. It was later found a few blocks away, next to a pair of blood-stained underwear. The other occupants were all asleep as the slaying unfolded. That led police to suspect that the intruder knocked her unconscious before assaulting her. Her body was partially naked, and police determined that she had been assaulted and bludgeoned with a brick wrapped in pantyhose. The brutality was immediately apparent, with her head split open by the force of the blows. The perpetrator entered the home through an unlocked sliding glass door and used manicure scissors to cut her dress and bra. Nellie was a well-liked, respected teacher, so everyone who knew her could not think that someone would have a motive to take her life. A decade before, she left an abusive husband. He and other men she dated were interrogated but it did not lead to finding a possible suspect. Fingerprints were recovered, but it was never tied to a specific person. DNA was collected at the autopsy. However, as DNA technology did not exist at the time, the case went cold despite decades of investigation. Soon, another horrendous crime would take place in the area. Teresa Pica was 48 years old and stayed on Edlow Drive in Hayward, California. On May 15, 1979, one of Teresa's twin 10-year-old daughters discovered her, slumped over her couch, face down. She was last seen alive the night before by her three children. Her nightgown had been pulled up, exposing her legs. Her hands were bound behind her back with a rope. A blood-stained rock was found next to her and a shirt that had been used to gag her. A front room window had been pried open. The only witness account of an intruder came from a neighbor who heard rustling near the home in the middle of the night. Teresa's purse was missing. Her wallet and other contents were later discovered in a neighbor's yard and in a garbage can down the street. As with Nellie's case, DNA was collected, but no technology existed to test it. Several people were investigated in the ensuing decades, but no suspects emerged. Two very similar cases, both women were found by family members who woke up in the morning to discover their loved ones' bodies bludgeoned and assaulted. An intruder had quietly entered their homes and attacked them as they slept in their living rooms. In 2023, investigators from the Hayward and Newark Police Departments consulted with the FBI and contracted Othram and Astria Forensics to reevaluate the DNA. That led to Fred Bernard Farnham being identified as the offender. Hayward and Newark Police announced in December 2023 that Farnham was responsible for the slayings of Nellie Ann Hicks in 1972 in Newark and Teresa Pica in Hayward in 1979. Farnham, frustratingly, passed away at the age of 73 in a hospital in Oregon in 2007. He grew up in Central Valley, California, and then moved to the South Bay in the 1950s. There, he was convicted for multiple assaults in the 1970s. There is no indication he ever lived in the East Bay. He also lived in Nevada, 
Idaho, North Dakota, Alaska, and Oregon, where he lost his life in the town of Cape Junction. The remains of one potential suspect, identified through the same process that found Farnham, were exhumed in 2021. It was later excluded through DNA comparison to the crime scene evidence. That man, however, was on the same genealogical tree, police said. David Hicks, the youngest of Nellie's six children and one of three still alive, thanked authorities who persisted to find closure in the 52-year-old cold case. Her son Ron, who found her body, passed away three months prior to the police solving Nellie's cold case. David called his mother a hero who raised a family of six and worked full-time as a teacher. I cannot express my gratitude enough for the police department and their dedication to this case. All of them worked extremely hard to bring closure to our family. In a statement read aloud at the news conference, Teresa's daughters similarly voiced relief at the resolution provided by Farnham's identification. Our mother may now rest peacefully, the statement reads. We have accepted the fact that whoever did this would never come to justice. Nevertheless, we thank God for your diligence and for never giving up. We can now move forward and close this painful chapter in our lives. Teresa's daughter, Jan Whelan, 62, told the San Francisco Chronicle that while it was a good thing to learn the suspect's identity after all these years, it also triggered everything again. For most of my life, I blamed myself because I was not able to stop what happened. And just a few years ago, I was able to finally tell myself that there was nothing I could do. But it still hurts. Now this will help bring me closure. Newark Police Captain Jolie Macias said after Teresa was slain, Newark and Hayward Police linked the crimes because of the discernible pattern of behavior shared by the two cases. This drove the belief that figuring out one case would solve the other. She also made a point to reciprocate the sentiments from the victim survivors by saying, Today is truly about these families and their resiliency for the past 50 plus years. Hayward Police Chief Brian Matthews said at the news conference that 45 years is a long time. It has been a long time for generations of investigators who have worked on this case, and it has been a long time for the families of the victims and our community as they have waited for answers. Officials suspect that Farnham could have been involved in other cases as well and have alerted law enforcement to look at their other cold cases for possible connections. Anyone with information about criminal cases that could have connections to Farnham can contact Haywood Police Detective Rob Purnell at 510-293-7176. Gary Ridgway, also known as the Green River Perpetrator, was born on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah. The media gave him this nickname after his first five victims were found in the Green River in Utah. He was a longtime painter at a truck company. His parents were Mary Rita and Thomas Newton Ridgway, and he had two brothers, Gregory and Thomas Edward. He was married to Claudia Craig Barrows from 1970 to 1972, to Marsha Lorene Brown from 1973 to 1981, and Judith Lorraine Lynch from 1988 to 2002. He only had one son named Matthew. Ridgway was convicted of 49 separate cases that took place between 1982 to 1998, possibly as recent as 2001. 
This made him the second most prolific serial offender in United States history, according to confirmed cases. He had been a suspect in the cases since 1982, when he was arrested for prostitution. However, investigators were unable to link him at that time. Detectives were unable to prove his role until 2001, when advances in DNA technology allowed them to link a saliva sample they had obtained from him in 1987 to male DNA found on several victims. He was arrested on November 30, 2001, as he was leaving the Kenworth Truck Factory where he worked in Renton, Washington. Over 10,000 items of evidence collected and logged and stored were prepared to go to trial when Ridgeway was arrested, according to Dave Reichert with the King County Sheriff's Office. At the time, investigators found he was not particularly accurate in associating dump sites with the victims that he placed there. To date, he has led the task force to the remains of three other victims, and he was incorrect about the identity of two of the three victims. In 2003, he pled guilty to 48 cases, and in 2011 to his 49th case. On December 18, 2003, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. As part of a plea bargain wherein he agreed to disclose the locations of still missing women, he was spared being executed. He is imprisoned at the Washington State Penitentiary, Walla Walla. Most of Ridgeway's victims were alleged to be prostitutes and other women in vulnerable circumstances, including underage runaways. His victims were between the ages of 14 to 38. In one of his confessions, he said he chose prostitutes as victims because he knew they were unlikely to be missed. Patty Eeks, one of the prosecuting attorneys assigned to the case, said the lack of emotion Ridgeway showed when he eventually admitted to taking the lives of the women was still troubling to her. She said Ridgeway came across as just an average, goofy, middle-aged guy. Some victims may have been comfortable getting into his truck due to his seemingly harmless personality. I think he looked for vulnerable women. He had this strange, underlying need to feel like he had a beautiful woman by his side. Often, the women that he picked up were attractive. He wanted to be one of those guys who was like, I have a beautiful woman with me. He did not necessarily feel like he had that in his personal life. Physical attractiveness was definitely part of it, she said. Ridgeway led investigators to the locations where he buried one of his victims by Green River. There, on August 21, 2003, 23 human bones and teeth were uncovered and listed only as Bones 20. After two decades, in 2023, Othram was able to identify the victim after examination of DNA extracted from the skeletal remains as Tammy Lyles. David Middleman, Othram's CEO, a molecular biophysicist and genetics expert, said the DNA was in very terrible shape, degraded. The company worked to build a new DNA profile based on the sample. Authorities contacted her mother, and using her reference sample, scientists were able to identify Tammy. Tammy's skull and other remains were found on April 23, 1985, at the Tualatin Golf Course near Tigrid, Oregon. It was identified in March 1988 using Tammy's dental records. In 2003, her brother, Jason Lyles, said that when her family buried her in the 1980s, they had to use a baby casket because we could not find all the parts of her body. You live with this for 20 years, wondering what happened. I cannot see myself ever finding closure, but I think it would settle a lot better if the guy would say, yeah, 
I did it. Tammy was a 16-year-old girl whose life was brought to an end in 1983. She stayed in Everett, Washington. She disappeared from downtown Seattle, Washington on June 9, 1983. In 2023, King County Sheriff Patricia Cole Tyndall said that Tammy's family does not want to speak to the media. We appreciate your support in granting the family the privacy they seek during this time, Cole Tyndall said. This breakthrough in the case comes after 15-year-old Lori Ann Respotnik was identified as another victim of Ridgeway's. Lori was born on November 13, 1967, and stayed in Juneau, Alaska. She disappeared in 1982 after a fight with her mother. She wanted a horse. A friend had one. All Lori had to do, she told her mom, was pay for feed and pay rent for the stall. Donna Hurley, her mother, said no. She did not have the money. She did not have the time. Her husband had passed away a decade prior. She was a single mother raising two teenagers. It was not practical. Laurie's disappearance would remain a mystery, an open wound, an aching phantom limb for more than four decades until her remains were identified as one of at least 49 victims. For 76-year-old Donna, Lori's disappearance, her absence, her demise have been an ever-present void for more than 40 years. I guess everybody calls it closure, but to me, it was just a relief, Donna said of Lori's identification. All of the what-ifs, how come, where has she been, all the questions that go through your mind, you quit trying to fool yourself that she is alive and well, raising a family and everything is good. It is just a relief that all of that is off your shoulders and off your mind. As a mother, part of me was still in denial. You build a wall around these things, she said. The tough thing is those walls start to crumble. Lori, she said, was a firecracker, interested in everything sports, the outdoors, horses, dogs, and cooking. She played baseball and ran track. She liked a snowmobile. At seven, she trained the family Labrador retriever, Ebony's Flippy Miss, but known as Flip, and showed her in a dog show. She could get A's without opening her books, Donna said. She did speak with her daughter one time after she ran away. It was Thanksgiving, either 1982 or 83. Lori called her grandparents home, where the family was gathered. She told them she would be sending Christmas presents. She said she was living in Seattle and she was happy. Lori's remains were discovered on December 30, 1985, about three years after she ran away from home and was marked as Bones 17. Parabon Nanolab's chief genetic genealogist, Cece Moore, did the genetic genealogy work. She works like a detective, using partial matches across many generations and multiple family trees to try to create a family tree, a lineage for the unknown person. She knew she was looking for a teenage girl, but Lori had left little trace. She was so young when she disappeared. She disappeared before social media, before online people searches, before the internet. She never voted, never bought property, never paid taxes. More scoured census records, birth announcements, yearbook photos. She came up empty. Then she stumbled upon an obituary. One paragraph on page 62 of the January 19, 1972, Seattle Times. Razpotnik, William S., of Juneau, Alaska, formerly of Seattle, husband of Donna, father of William George and Lori Ann. Donna she knew about. William George, Lori's brother, she knew about. 
She wrote a report and sent it to King County. And then, more than a year after Moore started searching, more than 40 years after Lori disappeared, two detectives showed up on Donna Hurley's doorstep. DNA was matched to a saliva sample from Donna to identify her. Donna had left Centralia, Pennsylvania and moved to Juneau, Alaska in the 1980s. Her parents lived there and the job prospects were better. She worked in the hotel business for a decade, at a veterinarian's office for 13 years, then for the Alaska Department of Education. Now retired, she has two grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. They are Lori's great and great-great nieces and nephews, although they have never met her. Lori's brother passed away in 2010 of cancer, just like her father. Over the years, Donna saw news coverage of the Green River perpetrator. She thought about it from time to time. We were in Alaska. We were so far removed, she said. I was still raising my son. I was trying to push all of it out of my mind. Law enforcement would post pictures and police sketches of victims. I never saw anyone that I felt looked like Lori, she said. Police posted a composite image of Bones 17, what they imagined she might look like based on DNA. Blondish hair, blue-green eyes, fair complexion. It took me a long time to admit it looked like her, Donna said. The composite image had straight hair, she thought to herself, but Lori had curly hair. A lot of it was denial. You become numb at a certain point. It is just, she paused, searching for words. It makes me sad that her life ended that way. Makes me angry at the person who did it. Makes me angry at myself that I could not stop it. And at a certain point, you just have to realize that you have another part of your family that you have to keep going forward for. Lori's idol, Donna said, was her dad. She does not think Lori ever got over his passing when she was only five. She was daddy's little girl. She had the curly ponytails and the big blue eyes. She plans to bury Lori at Evergreen Washelli Cemetery in Seattle, next to her dad. Dave Reichert with the King County Sheriff's Office said that although the last remains in the medical examiner's office have been identified, there are still more unsolved cases. Ridgway said that he ended the lives of 65 to 70 young women and little girls, and so far he has pled guilty to 49 and we have closed 51 cases. So as I said, there are other unsolved cases out there that may or may not be connected to Ridgway but there are parents still out there looking for answers about the whereabouts of their daughters. On April 21st, 2023, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee signed legislation removing execution from the state's law. According to the King County Prosecutor's Office, if Ridgeway is convicted of additional slayings outside of Washington State, he still could face execution. On December 6, 1975, in a field off 100th Avenue and Lowell Boulevard in Westminster, Colorado, a woman's lifeless body was found. She was found by two people riding their motorcycles. Her clothing and personal items were also found at the scene, so she could be identified as Terry Becker. She was 20 years old at the time. Terry grew up in Casper, Wyoming, and moved to the Denver metropolitan area after graduating from high school. Terry was described as a free spirit by her friends and family. She lived life on the edge. Terry enjoyed painting and listening to music. Her favorite bands were Three Dog Night and Steppenwolf. An autopsy was done, and it showed that she was assaulted and strangled. Terry had last been seen two days prior when she hitchhiked to visit her boyfriend 
at the Adams County Detention Center in Brighton, Colorado. Chandra Thurston, senior criminalist with the Westminster Police Department, who was the lead detective on the case, said she had just been dumped there in the field. Officers respond, an investigation begins, and then over time, you know, suspects are looked at and nothing develops. The case went cold. In 1991, a similar crime took place. Sherry Bridgewater was assaulted and slain in her apartment on the 1000 block of West Monroe Avenue near Owens and H Street in Las Vegas, Nevada. She was a 31-year-old mother of two boys and was found by two women, a friend and a relative. The investigation team worked the case relentlessly over the years to solve it, but unfortunately, the case went cold. In 2003, 12 years later, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation was able to extract DNA from a piece of evidence from Terry's case. The sample of an unknown male was uploaded to the CODIS Combined DNA Index System database, but no match was found. Ten years later, in 2013, the Las Vegas Metro Police Department entered DNA into their database from Sherry's perpetrator. The sample matched with Terry's perpetrator, so the two cases were connected. Before the DNA breakthrough, both cases were without a suspect. In 2019, technology and genetic genealogy pointed to a possible man. Thomas Martin Elliott, a veteran with an extensive criminal history. He was in prison for committing a burglary in Lakewood, Colorado, and was sentenced to six years in prison. He was released in 1981, and then he committed a serious offense against a 13-year-old girl in Carson City, Nevada. He was sent to prison on a life sentence, but with the option of parole. He got out 10 years later and then became the primary suspect in the cold case in Las Vegas. Five months later, on October 30, 1991, he took his own life by shooting himself. He was 40 years old. He was buried in the Southern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery due to the short enlistment he had with the military. The Las Vegas police did not have the resources to further investigate Elliot as a possible suspect. In October 2023, after seeking assistance from the Vegas Justice League, an organization who has helped the department solve several cold cases, they were able to receive funding from them, allowing police to exhume Elliot's body for a DNA sample. In 2024, it was confirmed. It was a match for both Terry and Sherry's cases. One challenge in identifying and linking the DNA was the fact that Elliot was adopted by his mother's second husband. His birth mother, Nancy West, had divorced his biological father later to remarry. Elliot's connection to Terry was not known, but the police found out that he and Sherry attended the same Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Chandra Thurston, senior criminalist with the Westminster Police Department, said it was almost a huge relief to finally say someone's name did this to Terry. There were definitely times during this where you felt, I am never going to figure this out. We are never going to figure this out. There is a lot of relief, and I hope that she knows we did not give up on her and we worked until we were able to find justice. Even if it is this way, without being able to prosecute someone, to find justice for her and to know that she mattered and that we always cared about her. A.C. Stutson, commander in investigations with Westminster Police said, there has been a lot of ups and downs in this case. We were so close many times and it would slip away David Becker, Terry's brother, is her only living relative. He lives in Texas and said the following, I cannot say enough how grateful I am. I just really applaud the Westminster Police Department. 
It is hard to believe after 45 years, the DNA can match and bring closure, which I am grateful for. Just knowing that, that person is not out there taking away some other sibling's life. To me, there is comfort in that. The case was groundbreaking for Westminster Police. It not only was their oldest cold case, but also the first one they have solved. Westminster Chief Norm Halbert said, As someone who represents the organization for years, this case started in 1975. And to be able to close it today and represent all the men and women who have worked on this case is an enormous sense of pride and an enormous sense of accomplishment for the agency. And it is also a sense of relief that we were able to close this for the family. Unfortunately, Sherry's parents passed away before her perpetrator was identified. LVMPD Lieutenant Johansson said that the police were able to notify both of her adult sons and bring some closure to her family. He added that the department is backtracking data to see if any additional cases may be connected to the same suspect.